Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Dr. Satyajit Rat, and we'll be discussing the vaccine trials, which now seem to be entering phase three, which means that they'll be much larger in number, and we could, in another three to six months, see successful trials and possibly its deployment. Of course, this round itself can start with perhaps looking at the more they, you know, those people who are more in danger, the hospital staff and so on, and maybe some of them will also be covered in this phase trials, this phase of trials. So it could welcome information. We now seem to have at least four vaccines which are going into four phase three trials. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's, it's welcome news. Um, it's not surprising news at all. Um, at this stage, uh, any surprises would have been unpleasant surprises. So I'm glad that uh, there are no surprises in this. All of these have been tested in at least two um, animal models. And uh, what they did in those animal models, they seem to be doing in these small scale human trials. Um, so I think that um, we are on track. Um, all of them have entered phase three clinical trials already. Um, Except the modern, which has yet to start its physical trial. Well, they, 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 they're doing the paperwork and yes. need to recruit. So, um, and and uh, clinical trials are starting in what five different locations across the world. In the UK, in China, in the US, in Brazil, in South Africa. So Also in the United Arab Emirates. Oh, even they have a, they're a center where it is being tested. Yes, they do. They do. Chinese, one of the Chinese vaccines is being tested there. So, um, so I think that the, these are expected good results, but they are small steps. They are an initial, very small step. What do those these four reports that everybody is talking about, which have come more or less coincidentally together? Uh, what do they tell us? They tell us some definitive evidence and they tell us some indicative information. The definitive evidence is that all four of these vaccines are safe. Or let me be correct. All four of these vaccine candidates are safe over the short term. Okay. And on a small number. On small numbers. Um, it's noteworthy that two of them are based on um, adenoviral vectors and two of them are based on RNA formulation. No, I think uh, no, there's one virus which the Chinese are doing, which is uh, actually inactivated uh, virus. The current report that we are looking at is the Chinese adenovirus 5 vector based vaccine. That is correct. That the is inactivated vaccine report has come early. Yes, but that's also entering phase. So in that three. sense, there are in that sense there are five candidates in play. How is it five? I'm just wondering. There is, is one. As to the Moderna is RNA, one. there is uh, BioNTech uh, um, Pfizer's RNA. Oh, okay, Pfizer's one also we're talking. There is the about chimpanzee this. adenovirus. There is the Chinese adenovirus, and there is the Chinese inactivated virus. In fact, what I'm trying to say is that we are going to see an exhilaratingly large number of these reports coming out in the coming weeks. Because if you look at, for example, if you look at the WHO um, status update document um, on the WHO site about vaccines, the latest is, I think, dated the 20th of July. So it's not that out of date or anything. And in that tab tabulation, there's a fair number of vaccine candidates which are in phase one. Oh, that's very large. So um, those results are going to start coming up in the next few weeks. So we are going to have, it doesn't matter, three, four, five candidates. We are going to see many more in the coming weeks. And I suspect that in all of them, the first result from the human trials are going to say exactly these two things. The but first, I, I, let me interrupt you for a minute over here. Why the, the, the Chinese two viruses and the AstraZeneca, they seem to have done a sufficiently, uh, for phase two, sufficiently large number, 600 to 
thousand or so. But the modernized small sample, it's really only about six. Yes, there are uh, significant differences in the numbers. Huh. And, um, you know, one, one could always quibble about, about it all. Keep in mind that the Oxford um, chimpanzee adenoviral vaccine report that we have, the actual phase two level data are not from all samples. Okay. In fact, the paper actually specifies correctly that this is a preliminary analysis being reported because all tests have not been as yet complete. Okay. So th this is why I'm saying that the current step has two components. The definitive component, as we said, is that these things seem to be safe when people get injections. Safe over the short term, safe in adults, safe in adults of European and healthy adults of European ancestry in the main, except for the Chinese uh, uh, trials. Um, so there are caveats, but this is good that they are safe. The non-definitive indicative component of the evidence is that all of them seem to generate antibody responses in pretty much all vaccine the candidate recipients. All of these antibody responses seem to show virus neutralization capacity. All of these vaccinees, these vaccine recipients, also generate T lymphocyte responses against the cells are activated. Start. Keep in mind that the, the antibody level it can at least be analyzed for, as I said, virus neutralization capacity. The T cell responses at this point have not been and really, properly speaking, cannot be um, examined for their protective contribution. Okay. So we have so definitive we evidence get about it for a minute. indicative yes. evidence about the immunity. Just, just yes. to make it clearer to our viewers, the antibody response will be also will be protected. While the T cell at the moment we cannot say how much what will be the protective response. How do you sort of can you elaborate a little on that? So you can measure the antibody response in ways that don't tell you whether that antibody response is likely to be protective or not. Okay. But you can also do so-called virus neutralization tests with the antibodies. And if they show the capacity for virus neutralization, then it's a reasonable um, piece of information that they may be protective. They're okay. likely to be protective. It's not evidence of protection, but it says they're likely to be Exactly similarly, you can test to see whether there are T cell responses, and there are. But at this point, nobody's done even indicative tests to ask whether the T cell responses have any antiviral capacity. Okay. They so, get awake, but we don't know whether they can attack and destroy the virus. That's what it really means. Or the cells which get infected and therefore take out the to be fair, those are much harder tests to do. Oh. The antibody, the virus neutralization tests for antibodies are hard enough to do, oh. which is why the results between the four pap papers are uh, uh, for, uh, for 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 fine readers. The results are a mess, but broadly they still say this. So we know now there is antibody response. We know now there is T cell response. We know that the antibodies may, may be able to neutralize the virus in case of the infection, but we do not know whether the T cell response will be able to do so or not, at least definitely. So that's where we are at the moment. And that's why, of course, we need larger scale trials to test it through the fire, so to say, of the actual large scale exposure to infection, and Absolutely. as well to see whether there are any possible side effects, which can also be harmful. Absolutely. So there are 
additional nuances to this, especially when you consider all four reports. That are still not adding the fifth one, which is also entering clinical trials because we don't seem to have a, a report about it, or at least not recently. So the interesting thing is that the adenoviral vaccines as well as the RNA vaccines, on the one hand, they are safe. On the other hand, they are pretty damned painful. They are pretty damn painful. If you look at the data, mm. they, um, the, the amount of redness, swelling, local tenderness, a little bit of fever, all of this is, is quite notable. So uh, for, for, for people of um, sufficiently advanced stage such as you and me, it is reminiscent of the vaccines that we used to take when we were children, where the arm would swell and you would feel uh, horrible and miserable for a day or two and so on and so forth. Now, is this a huge problem for these vaccines? On the one hand, no, in the sense that these are transient effects, they'll pass, and if the vaccines work, it's well worth it. But in this day and age of social media, mediated amplification of anti-science, irrational, anti-vaxxer movements, um, this is something to be considered about how successful implementation and acceptability of these vaccines will be. Well, that hopefully will be more in the United States, that for some strange reason, there is a strong body of people who do not believe in science, believe in even in flat earth. By the way, their numbers are also growing. And of course, the anti-vaxxer. But coming to the question of ill effects, possible ill effects, the Moderna report seems to indicate that a few more, uh, shall we say, beyond pain effects have also been observed. Is that correct? Well, you know, they've, they've reported one severe effect, I think. Um, I, frankly, I'm not inclined at this point to to be judgmental about it. So it could be, if we have a much larger sample, we so, will find that this is an out so I think outcome. that uh, the, uh, the data, safety, data and safety management boards have all uh, correctly, uh, generally supported movement forward into phase three. And in the phase three, we will see what the results look like. Keep in mind that the uh, numbers of in terms of the magnitude of immune responses of the Moderna uh, vaccine seem to be larger than that, for example, of the Oxford vaccine. Now that brings up um, the second of my particular bees in the bonnet about nuances, because I think that um, our, our uh, listeners should be cautious about the interpretations of these numbers. These are not absolute numbers of universal uh, meaningfulness. So in a sense, different tests with different levels of sensitivity would give different numbers. And since these are very different centers doing their own tests, depending on the local configuration of the test, the numbers would look quite different. In fact, if you look at the Oxford vaccine reporting paper, they've done three different virus neutralization tests. And the numbers in the three virus neutralization tests are completely different from each other. So I think that it's important to uh, keep in mind that uh, these absolute numbers may not mean anything other than 
technical differences. Yes, I guess also the ultimate test will be do they protect us or they don't. Absolutely. And the numbers are only very rough indicators and they don't really tell us where it will protect and where it will not. Plus what you are saying, the calibration of the numbers itself is a problematic issue because they're not calibrated to a common quote unquote viral utilization standard. So these are the caveats we have to take into account. But the bigger caveat, we don't know how long the, if there is protection, how long the protection will last. Absolutely. So that's other, other big iffy in this game that if, if some of the reports are true, it is possible that we might need to have vaccines every six months, every year, every two years, if we are lucky. Absolutely. Um, uh, the Oxford trial, for example, um, shows data until day 56 or so. Um, some of the others show even less. So uh, all we know is that within a month of vaccination, Pretty much everybody makes a respectable antibody response with some neutralization capacity and pretty much everybody makes T cell responses, both of which are good things. But that's all we know at this point. Um, there is yet another nuance since you bring this up that uh, our listeners might find interesting. And that is, um, the use of boosters, of second doses. So the Oxford vaccine, for example, uses an ex a minute number of people, 10, to give a second dose of the same vaccine. And it shows that the second dose improves the antibody levels, uh, although it does not show any measurable improvement of the T cell response. Again, these are all small, useful, uh, uh, minor findings. Nothing can be said from any of this of definitive public health significance at this point. They are all a small technical value. But the good thing is adverse reactions have not been observed, except one maybe outlier in the modern case. But all other vaccine trials, phase one, phase two, the primary purpose of which is also safety. So that has been at least found to be. Yeah, we should keep in mind that this, um, this, this conflation, this, this uh, merging of phase one and phase two um, carries its own um, difficulties. Phase one is formally supposed to be about safety evaluation. Phase two is formally for vaccines supposed to be about definitive evidence of whether good reliable immune responses are generated. Um, to have published reports that say that um, the immune response related reporting is preliminary, partial, and uh, incomplete because this, this is a sort of phase one oblique phase two trial um, leaves us slightly uncertain about just how robust the evidence is for the generation of immune responses. When I look at the numbers, they look good. I, 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 will not uh, at all raise any worries about it. Nonetheless, we, we must remember that phase one and phase two have these two clearly distinct uh, purposes in formal terms. And while the first purpose has been served well, the second still seems to be somewhat, um, shall we say, soft evidence. Good evidence, but soft evidence. soft evidence. So hopefully with more tests, etc., we'll get a better picture. But this another report comes which they seem to have promised, we might get a better picture. And if we start the clinical trials early enough for phase three, 
some of that evidence will also help us make a better judgment about these things. Indeed. So all, all in all, cautious optimism, two caveats. We do not know how strong the protective action is. That's a one question mark. We have to see how it really fares on that. And the second is how long will the immune response last and when we might need the booster or an additional vaccine or the vaccination again. But leaving these two things out, the last question. It's also interesting that we have two Chinese vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna and Oxford. All three seem to have been backed by the US, uh, what is uh, the warp speed uh, project? Lightning. Or whatever. Yeah. They called it the warp speed. I see. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm raising the issue that will it also mean that they will have control over the vaccine itself by having given such large amounts of money? Well, clearly there is control because clearly um, uh, governments have already made deals with the vaccine developing organizations about uh, priority in vaccine supply in speculative terms. Um, the US and the UK government seem to have made uh, some sort of deals about priority supply to them and so on and so forth. All of which comes back down to something that we've been discussing on this forum over the past two months. And that is that the vaccine technologies in the plural themselves are not going to be the bottleneck. As we can see, we are already at four or five in the coming few weeks, not even months, in the coming few weeks, we'll have even more candidates coming to the, exactly this stage. There'll be large numbers going into phase three. By the end of this calendar year, as we said earlier, uh, with cautious optimism, we will, in all likelihood, begin to get first generation protective efficacy, at least for short periods of time and significant production in um, disease susceptibility. The real problem is going to be what, on the one hand, is the plan for manufacturing, supply chain, delivery and implementation of vaccination. And even more, what is the legal, political, economic struggle to ensure rapid, affordable, actual delivery of the vaccine to the world's poor? And if we want to do that, that means the government has to start creating the necessary infrastructure and the legal as you called it, the legal, political, economic strategy for doing so. Because exactly. if you don't, then we'll get what is happening with uh, Remdesivir. The medicine is either available at black market rates because it's simply not enough supplies. And it's still, even when the supplies are available, it's 30,000 rupees to 35,000 rupees uh, you know, for a treatment. Five, six injections over five days you get to, to spend 35, 36,000 rupees, which probably costs all of 1,000 rupees at best. So you are seeing profiteering on COVID-19 on a scale. And since we have not seen any action by the government on when this appear, the question that arises that are they going to wait for the Indian vaccine for the Indian people? Or are we going to see what you said, what I understood you to say, that if the vaccine succeeds, Duplicating it with local skills and local infrastructure is not a problem. It's not a problem provided governments address the issues that we've been discussing head on proactively. Whether the government will do so or not remains an open question. But it's, this is the time to talk about it and not after the vaccine is available to the rest of the world and we start thinking about how to do it. I mean, if we look at our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, this has been almost of the same kind that we first issued the lockdown orders and then we decided what do we have to do under the lockdown. There's no preparation. 
there is no blueprint for the lockdown except one announcement by the prime minister four hours lock everything down and then it became a police action curfew yeah. across the country that that was the effect of the lockdown so if we don't prepare now and we have six months to leave time to do so we may be in the same boat yes absolutely and this is particularly important when the international fora in which to do this kind of global health policy coordination on the one hand glo global um, trade policy coordination on the other hand are um, in uncertainties the us has pulled out of the who the world trade organization lacks a head currently no, no, it doesn't only lack, lack a head, it also doesn't have a lung or a, a stomach because the, the, basically the dispute settlement body, which is the key power of the w, WTO, that has one member and they can't meet unless they have three members. So the US is not allowed any member to... So under those circumstances, governments have to come up with innovative, proactive strategies for um, planning for this. And uh, at least in the public uh, discourse, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that it is doing so. And again, for our viewers, that under Indian law, which is basically the Patent Act, we have complete powers to do any of the things we have talked about, compulsory licensing, under health emergency, all of these measures are available in public interest, both of which are in this case too are available. So the question is having, as you said, the political will to do so, because economically, there is really no bar. If you can, what is it, give lakhs of crores of rupees as largest in some sense to the capitalist class, surely for public health, this can, money is also available. And other, other issue that you talked about technology and infrastructure, actually we have a huge vaccine infrastructure that exists in the country. So using that for Indian people should be should not be a problem. Oh yes, absolutely. It is the political will that is the primary bottleneck, and the political will to confront the countries which at the moment are the ones, what shall we say, and sabotaging the global organizations that exist, which in this particular point are really particularly important. The question is not how good they are. The question is they exist. And the absence of those organizations mean a lack of coordination for public health at the global level. And this is not a disease that you can live with and say, okay, it doesn't matter. Let's hope, you know, things will improve. You have to stop it at the moment with vaccines. There doesn't seem to be anything else that will work in the long run, except the vaccine. As of now. Absolutely. Okay, Satyajit, thanks for being with us, explaining the intricacies of vaccine development and immune responses. I'm sure that you know we'll continue to throw light on this difficult issues which have to go beyond the headlines of the newspapers. This is all the time we have for News Click today. Do keep watching News Click and do visit our website. Thank you.